What's happening? This is Avadon, and welcome to another episode of Beats for Breakfast. Today, I am joined by a very special guest, the one and only MVG, also known as Modern Vintage Gamer. What's going on? Thank you for coming on, man. What's up, Avadon? Thank you for having me on, man. I'm a big fan of your your show, your channel. Uh, follow you on Twitter, of course. Uh, I love uh, the PE podcast that you guys uh, get up to on, on, during the week. So yeah, man, I, I'm I'm all about you, man. So thank you so much for having me on the show. And I've been I've been watching some of your uh, other episodes, and man, you got some pretty pretty dope guests on. So I feel honored and you know and happy to be a part of that. So thanks for having me. Thank thank you for wanting to come on. I just said. You know, we talked about music a little bit long on a retro, so I just said, oh, you yeah, know what? Yeah. Let me let me see if we could just kind of somewhat continue that conversation where yeah. it's not, you know, we're not in the way of you handling business. So for sure, yeah, and uh, it was great to meet you at Long Island, man. I was uh, I was getting pulled in about ten different directions, unfortunately, that day, but uh, it was it was a good show, man. Did you did you like the show? I did, understandably. That show was for me. It was at the end of the day. Yeah. I hit that show and I was like, oh man, I said, I got to get this all recorded because my energy levels, when I sat down on that chair, I'm being real with you, but I sat down on my chair. I was like, I did not know how tired I was Yeah, because I was to funny story about that. A few minutes later, it wasn't me. It wasn't you. It was me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I, I feel you, man. Um, it was actually my first convention I've ever been to, believe it or not. So I was, uh. Yeah, I was, uh, man, I was so tired that day. Like, it, it's just, you know what it's like when you get there. Exactly. It's just boom, boom, boom. There's just so much going on. You, you bump into people, you're looking at the vendors, people are talking to you, people want to hang out. Um, it, it's just crazy. That, I, lo I love it, man. I love the energy of those events. There. That's what I fun. love, too. And I feel you. I feel you. So it was... But it was definitely great, at least, like, being able to run into you and talk. Because I said, you know what? That's one person I said I might at least try to look out for when I get get down over there. So nice. I'm glad we had a moment to actually you yeah. know talk for a little bit. Yeah, I, I, likewise, man. I really uh, appreciated meeting up with you, and uh, I'm sure I'll be. They're already talking to me about next year, so I'm sure I'll be back next year uh, if you know if if that if it all works out. So I my I have I I have folks that live literally 35 minutes away from the venue. So right on. It's if. If it's usually it's on the weekend, so I can make that trip. Yeah, yeah. So. And I, I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to kind of, you know, get get sad and, and depressed. But uh, the reason why I actually um, wanted to go this year was so I could meet Etika. Uh, unfortunately, that was, you know, as we know, that was uh, something that never worked out, which was, uh, you know, which was which is, which is a shame. But uh, he was there last year, and I know some of the guys met with him there, and I was kind of really hyped to meet with him, but. Yeah. I almost met him that that that, that time yeah. in um, 2018. I almost met him. Um, a buddy I was hanging out with, he hung out. He got a chance to to, to meet him. Um, shout out to Rex the Great. He yeah. got a he got a chance to meet with Etika and you know RG85. They, they all got a chance to meet with Etika, and it was the mm -hmm. day that I had to leave. Right. They met him. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been an interesting year, you know, and uh, sadly, uh, yeah. I do I do I did definitely miss him, and yeah, I was really hoping I could get a chance to meet with him. But hey, you know, um, got to meet with so many other really cool people at the show, and um, you know, again, hopefully I'll, I'll be back next year. So yeah, definitely, definitely. But on on a brighter note, when I <laughs> looked at your your um your logo. I've noticed the little wave art, the little audio wave art there. That that told me something like, <laughs> there's some music there because not that's not something everyone just uses. You know, video yeah. editors don't use, but people who do music usually use that. So right. Um, and then I saw on Studio Nintendo's video, you use um Reaper as your DAW. So uh -huh. and for those of you who don't know what a DAW is, that's Digital Audio Workstation. Um, how long have you been into music production? For well. My background is actually, um, uh, I've been a guitar player for many years. In fact, if you look behind me, I've got, I see. Uh, three, <laughs> I've got, I've got two six strings and a bass back there. I see them. So I, to kind of take you back a little while, when I was growing up as a kid in my kind of early teenage years, I really wanted to learn how to play guitar. And, you know, my, my dad bought me my first guitar and um, I kind of, I've been playing guitar since I was a teenager. And, wow. 
Um, only over the last, as far as music production goes, it's something I've always been interested in. And honestly, man, like I never really knew where to start. Like this is like about maybe six or seven years ago because I heard about stuff like garage band and you know you could you could use your uh, iphone to, to make music on but it, that never really kind of clicked with me about well how, how do you do that how does it actually work you know and so me being the the nerdy technical it guy that i am i i decided to kind of read up on this and and see well i know how to play guitar I, i've got some musical abilities so let's see if i can like you know write some write some music and 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 you know do some productions so Long story short, I started kind of researching doors, right? And I was like, well, which one do I use? Because there's so many of them out there. You know, there's Reaper, there's Pro Tools, Cubase. You know, there's there's tons of different choices. And 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 for me, I'm kind of, I'm a pretty simple kind of guy. I mean, I know that sounds a little strange, but man, the easier and the better user experience, you know, is, is what I'm going to go with, right? Mm -hmm. But I didn't want to use GarageBand because I, I mean, first of all, GarageBand is like Apple. So I don't want to be kind of tied to the Apple ecosystem because I've got, got a PC, I'm not using a Mac. So I thought, well, Reaper is something that kind of um, came up as, hey, this is like a free, well, it's not free. It's like there's a 60 day kind of trial. You can mess around with it. And then it's like, I think it's like $30 to register it. So I thought, well, I'm going to give this a go and, and see what this can do. And of course, you know, how, how, how do you learn a DAW, right? I, I watch YouTube videos of other people, you know, showing you how, to, how it works. So I started to kind of just get familiar with how to put some basic tracks down and I bought a um, an audio interface and started rigging my guitar through it and then you know of course the first thing that you realize is well this sounds this doesn't sound very good so I need I need to get some plugins right so then you kind of go down the path of well what plugins do I start to buy and then there's all these kind of amp simulators that you can get um, so you start to you start you, you kind of just start to understand how this whole system works how, the, how this whole process works and mm -hmm. I guess slowly over the years, um, you know, I've gotten more familiar with the the production process, and it, and it started out with me just messing around doing four tracks, you know, two guitar tracks left and right, bass track and and like a drum track, and I'd, I'd kind of do rock and metal type stuff, and then I was like, well, that's kind of cool, but what about like synthesizers and doing some some cool synth wave you know how, how do i do that you know and so i bought a uh, a midi keyboard and and kind of went from there and i guess i guess you know that's kind of the the labor of you know the work that i've been doing it's it's not really something that i'm i i feel like i'm like super professional on and it's not really something that i um, I'm trying to like market as like I'm a serious musician or I'm a serious producer. Honestly, man, it's like things that I do that can complement my YouTube channel and make sure that I don't get demonetized. So that you know things like that, right? So I just uh, you know write your own music and 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 hopefully it will uh, it will you know people will like it. And the cool part is you know I set up a Bandcamp page and people really like. The music that I do, and I've gotten some really good feedback on it, and um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's now kind of like a—I don't want to say it's a side hustle to the side hustle, but it's it's something that I always like to go back and you know every every couple of weeks I'll put down some you know more music tracks and hopefully I can get some more more tunes out. But um, to the logo, uh, that was actually done by um, uh, Evan uh, Spawn Waves uh, uh, editor. So uh, I was yeah. So I was I was I, I kind of went on Twitter. I was I went I went uh, on Twitter one day and said, hey, I'm I'm looking for some uh, some artists to, to do some artwork for for the uh, for the channel. And uh, Evan hit me up and said, you know what what kind of designs do you have in mind? And I said, I want something kind of synth wavy, you know and so he just uh i mean he's pretty good man he just kind of slapped that together i was like yeah yeah that's it that's what i want so uh it kind of it kind of went from there so uh so yeah nice nice yeah. um when it comes to starting off with a doll and having an easy work workflow experience i yeah. i agree with you um my choice is fl studio yeah and i'm, I'm learning that now so one of the problems with with getting stuck into one door is you kind of don't really know the 
um, you know, what else is out there, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And FL Studio is really good for um, for beats, you know, um, and something like Reaper is probably not as good for beats. It's good for it's good for like rock and metal, you know. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to do like four four, uh, you know, time, you know, metal tracks. I mean, Reaper is great. Like everyone that does metal uses Reaper, and that's kind of why I went that direction because, like I said, I'm I'm a kind of a guitar player and I'm a metal guy and a rock mm -hmm. guy. So, but. Um, I'm, I'm learning uh, FL Studio at the moment, actually, and I got to say, I'm, I'm struggling a bit because everything is so different than what I'm used to. But I also realize there's a lot more power here that I can tap into. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of going down that path. So what, what's your experience like with, with FL Studio? FL Studio, I've been using FL Studio C a little over 15 years now, and I would say it's, it's the easiest one to learn but it's the hardest to master in yeah. my opinion because it's so much in that system i've shown people the interface they it look it could look overwhelming yeah where you first jump in but i've seen people who use cubase reasons pro tools and it doesn't compare as mm -hmm. much uh, fl studio i feel like you have so much intricate power when it comes to making your own original tracks where you could link in your MIDI sample. I have my MIDI keyboard right here. Yeah. You could link in almost any MIDI keyboard. MIDI keyboard. You could link in your own instruments. You could put in your vocals. Um, FL Studio doesn't get this much credit, but you can even use it as your own recording studio. You can record your own voice into the software. Yep. So there's so much that you can do. and. Mm -hmm. The plugins that you're allowed to use, um, I I have um, Native Instruments. Yep. So yep. I have, okay. So if you since you know, I have the Complete Twelve Ultimate. So oh wow. So I have a whole bunch of sounds that nice, you can man. use. Now let me ask you about that because I know you're interviewing me, but I'm I'm curious now. I got to I got to ask. Go ahead. Go ahead. Because dude. <laughs> My problem with with too many plugins is I don't know where to start. You know, it's like having like a you know, it's like you go down and look at your massive collection of video games, and you're like, what am I going to play today? And you just you kind of look at everything, and you're like, and you don't play any of them. You know what I mean? I get it. My my issue that I have, and this is something I'm trying to actively resolve, is that I've got all these plugins, man, like from everywhere I've got these free plugins i've paid for some you know and it's like well where do i get the sound that i'm looking for i, I gotta kind of it's like going through you know phone book trying to find f what, what you're looking for it's it's tough and, and i think for me and i don't know how what your workflow is like but for me you know i'm thinking about like just having a because right now i do everything on one computer which is like what i use for youtube and and um programming and music everything is kind of it's on this one pc i'm really thinking about just like having a specific dedicated machine for music and just having the plugins that i use versus like all these plugins from everywhere that that uh, were cool when i first got it all because i was like i want everything so i want every single sound i can get but you quickly realize that you know you don't need all these plugins man no. you just need the sounds that that you know that kind of resonate with you so h how do you kind of deal with that stuff like that kind of what i do is i actually it's funny you say that because i actually started getting into that and this is where i've transitioned into beat making more so into sound design yeah. and i create my own sound so i create my own drums and the drums that i like i'll tweak the drums to the way that i want to and i save yeah. them into a separate wave file or a separate file themselves and then i have a folder where those are my own separate sounds that i use yeah and basically when you're ready that there's your workflow you just go to your own set folder and all the sounds you want are right there That's ready perfect. for you that's perfect. So that's what I do. That speeds up workflow a lot. Yeah. Um, also, the second doll that I use, I go back to every now and then is Machine. Oh, I'm, right. Yeah. yeah. I have Machine. So I, I have Machine Studio. So it's like when I don't want to point and click and actually get on the pads and get a better hand on things, mm -hmm. um, I use Machine Studio. Um, I will say the mixing is better because you have actual knobs. 
Yeah. Rather than you have to pull down like the the mixer on the, with point and click key with a mouse, I feel the mixing is fine is more fine tuned because not only can you fine tune um, mixer tracks for volume, but on different plugins, uh, you could fine tune let's say the reverb. You could fine tune how the wet. You could f the wet setting. Yep. You could fine tune the damp setting. You could fine tune um, how. You can fine tune pretty much anything, and even even how powerful you want a delay effect. So that's why I personally um, like Machine, and sometimes I'll use Machine plugged in with FL Studio. Yeah. So I would say the best bet is to really, like you said, have your own sounds, so you can really start a workflow, and you can just make magic happen at that point. Yeah, yeah. And I, for me, I mean, my biggest thing is I. I spend too much, t and this is kind of the the guitar player in me. Like I spend too much time trying to get the right sounds. You know, like mm. I, dude, I can spend hours trying to find the right sounds, Same and there. then I'm just I'm just tired, man. I'm like, okay, now you know I'll just take a break, and then I never go back to it. You know, I'll go back to it like in a week or something. So having having the ability to to spin up some sounds quickly, like you said, I think is is important for sure. One of the things else that I helps is. I'll hear a sound and then I had to train myself to hear the sound differently where yeah. most of the sounds will sound weak at first, but I think to myself, how does will this sound if I added some reverb to it? How would this sound if I added some added a phaser effect to it? So right. this way it you hear the sound differently at that point, it could give more of the filler effect that you really want. Yeah. And that's the sound that I save and make my own because I said I want to use that in the future. Right. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think getting the that full wide, you know, stereo sound, it's like one of the hardest things you can do. Like yeah. the, 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 the other side of, of DAWs for me is the mastering and the mixing process. Like, I mean, how many times have you have you put something down and you've you've you know you mixed it and you've done the final kind of render on it and then you you listen to it on your speakers on your PC and you think, man, that sounds dope, and then you listen to it in the car and it sounds like, it sounds like dope, you know what I mean? And it's funny because like I've heard stories about people actually they go into their cars with their laptops and they they mix and master it in the car. Yeah. And I was like, what? But you know what i mean it, it's true right i mean it, that makes a lot of sense to me because there's so many times where things don't sound right you know in different scenarios and, and getting 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 the sound to be sound good no matter where you are and no matter what what you're listening through that's like an art form dude like i i, I want to learn how to do that stuff and i think that's 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 where the, the you know the big dollar producers uh make their money because you know that that's what they're good at you know Mixing is my bread and butter. I love mixing, and um, I got to show you these headphones. And then I'll send this. I'll send you a link on Twitter. All oh, right, on yeah. I have KRK headphones. Nice. So you already know these are monitor headphones. They get the yeah, same yeah. effect as monitor speakers, which gives yep. you that balanced sound. So what I do is whenever I'm making music, I use those headphones because. Most times at night, um, I don't have the house to myself where I could use the speakers at full blast. Right. My monitor speakers are Yamaha speakers. Yep, that's which, what I got. Which yeah. ones? Uh, yeah, what, the YS fives or the YS? Yeah, the, uh, yeah. I would say this. They were passed down to me. Let me just say they're old enough to have to use speaker wire. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So these right are old, these are like the uh, older edition, but they still work really good. Oh, uh, dude, the Yamahas are legit. They. And yeah. I'll say, even listening to the speak the beats on those, I can hear where the sound isn't as good. I can hear right. where, okay, like what I hear from my headphones, I hear from those speakers. I'm like, all right, the bass could be up a little bit more. It's like the sound's a little, little too much on the high end. So it's like, you got to take a lot of time. It's a real tedious process. And one of the things, um, another good producer, he, he said this, and I took this to heart. Uh, Curtis King, he said, um, you should never mix the same day you're creating a beat. Oh, dude, I, I totally, I totally <laughs> believe that. Yeah. And yeah. the reason behind it is because you're using two different parts of your brain. Yeah. You're using a creative side of your brain to make the music, but the mixing requires a more analytical side of your brain. And it's like, you got to let it sit first. You, so yeah. one day you should just let it. I'm gonna make this and just take your time make, making the music and then the next few days you go ahead and 
mix down and you really make magic happen at that point that's that's a really good advice i'll definitely take that on board because i'm you know once i get a, a a track down i want to get it like out there as quickly as possible and i think that's that's probably one of the reasons where i'm, I'm kind of failing you know so I, I yeah i'll definitely uh give that some thought going forward yeah yeah because when you take your time because i used to be like that it's like i'll I'm like, yo, this sounds so good. Like you, like people have to hear it. But yeah, right. I've taken my time to take a step back and say, let me take a few more days with this. And I've noticed is like when I did that, I did that for the beat remixes. I did those in a in a matter of a few days. Even when I remix with Nick, it's like I did those in a span of few days, and the sound quality is so much better. Yep, it's so much better than my own regular work. So. Mm -hmm. But um, cool. Yeah, I'll definitely uh, take that one on 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 board for sure. I'm always looking for advice like that. You know, I I follow some of the music producers on YouTube, and they always have really good good tips. You know, some of them, you know, some of them are pretty obvious. You know, about what what to do and what not to do. But mm -hmm. sometimes, yeah, and it, it applies to not just music production. A lot of things. You know, if you take a step step back, um, like if you're having a bad day at work or something. You know. Um, you just you come home you don't worry about it you uh you spend some time with the family and just relax unplug and then you know um or if you if, 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 if you're into a beef with someone or you know a friend is, is, you're fighting with someone you know taking it taking that step back for a while and then and then you know um dealing with it like the next day is is is, is good advice so I, I think it applies to a lot of things in in life for sure indeed indeed yeah but um I want to move over to this uh, gaming question because we're approaching the end of the and not only the end of the year but the end of the decade. Yes. What do you feel was like the biggest game changer in terms of hardware for gaming this decade? Ooh, man, that's a good question. I I, I would probably say, I would probably say the Nintendo Switch that's was my, that. That was my thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if I think back at the decade, I mean, we had some pretty big moments, but I don't think anything was bigger than the Switch. I mean, that that really was a game changer, you know, for so, in so many ways. I mean, the Wii U came out and you could see what Nintendo was trying to do um, because in a lot of ways, the Wii U is the predecessor to the Switch. You know, they had the, the tablet idea, but you couldn't really take the tablet more than a few feet away from the from the base station but you know they had that kind of concept in their heads but they really refined that with the switch and i mean look where we are man it's like you know almost 50 million switches sold um Crazy. and it's just gonna it's just gonna power on and, and sell probably 100 million you know when it's all said and done probably more than that actually so yeah i mean i think for me the switch has been probably the the biggest thing of the decade um yeah i mean it's almost i'm th i'm thinking of like other things like you know the xbox uh well the 360 came out in 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 didn't come out this decade but uh, the connect did but i mean the connect was wasn't really anything special it, you know it it, it kind of came and it was kind of cool for a while but it, it just kind of faded away but no nah, man I, I would say the switch was was definitely the you know the the, the big the big thing of the decade for sure it was. I mean, we yeah. had we had V VR has always been around, but VR in the console gaming, yeah, was well, it was a semi game changer, but it didn't really hit well until like the latter part of the decade. Yeah, and then we also had the Xbox One X in terms of what's actually packed in there. Yeah, you could say it's game changing because that's more of a mini supercomputer, but still, it's like the Nintendo Switch literally was innovation at its finest it's it really made you play gaming differently and i think it it marketed more so to an older generation more than a younger generation it marketed more so to people who don't have the time to play yeah. in front of the tv or for just people who just you know want to take their their gaming console to another room and not have to worry about playing in the same room all the time. I can I couldn't imagine all the time. It's like I was stuck in my room playing the same game all the time. Now it's like I can go from my room and transition to my couch with yeah. the same experience. So. Absolutely. And you know, to, to 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 add to that, I mean, you know, you're not looking for uh, cables. You're not looking for uh, you know. You just you just take this thing with you, and and 
if you want to stream with it it's really simple to do just you know mount the dock and and go from there it's it's the it's the ultimate you know hybrid system and that's the other thing you know it's 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 a truly a hybrid system it's not a handheld and it's not a you know a uh, a regular console it's both both of those things and I mean, switch light aside, of course, which is a handheld. Um, the the idea and the design is is truly, truly, um, you know, the most fascinating and best thing that that ha- has happened this decade, no doubt. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Well, guys, we have given you guys a lot of info you could take in, especially if you guys are aspiring musicians. I hope that was valuable for you guys. We're gonna go ahead for a quick commercial break, and we'll be back shortly. potential increase of heat so there needs to be a trade-off between performance increases and power consumption so let's go ahead and take a look at overclocking on the nintendo switch and this information may lead to some discoveries about what we think the switch pro may end up being specification wise as well as performance wise now i will say that i have no affiliation or no contacts at nintendo so i don't even know if this rumor is actually real this is really just the evidence and the supporting information that I'm bringing to the table to suggest what the Nintendo Switch Pro may look like if one does indeed come out. Before we proceed, let's recap the important specs of the Nintendo Switch that we need to discuss. The Switch uses the NVIDIA Tegra X1 system on a chip. It runs a 4-core ARM A57 processor at 1 GHz in both docked and handheld modes. The GPU runs 256 CUDA cores and runs at 768 MHz when docked and 307 MHz when in portable mode. The Switch has 4GB of RAM with the memory speed being switchable, get it, between 1600 MHz when docked and 1331 MHz when in handheld mode. The video output maximum is 1080p at 60 frames per second. Many games adapt. Welcome back, everybody. Hope you enjoyed that small break that we had. So um, this is a dope conversation so far we had about music. And I have to really ask um, your question, MVG, because we talked about music. And I was just curious, like you're known for your hardware and your tech gaming videos back Mm -hmm. on YouTube. But I need to know your interest with people using like Game Boy Advances as MIDI controllers, because that's something that I saw. Uh, well, I, I tell you what, man. Like I, 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 I MIDI controllers uh, is something that I'm very in, into right now, um, and I have been for quite a while. Um, the Game Boy Advance one, I think I, I'm familiar with the one. It's basically the uh, the Roland cartridge or some type of cartridge yeah. you plug in that that allows you to basically set it up as a MIDI controller. Mm-hmm. I, I haven't actually used that one, but what I will tell you is I've used uh, PC computers, um, old kind of computers from back in the day, and used the MIDI capabilities of like the sound cards that mm. they have. So. As far as the Game Boy Advance stuff is, it, it's interesting because, look, MIDI, if you kind of read up on what MIDI is, it's nothing but kind of ones and zeros, man, over yep. the wire. Like, th- there's no samples, there's no, like, instruments, like, tied to it. The instruments are just a bank of of music samples that would come provided with, with the cartridge. But MIDI by itself is just you know a a um, a playbook of here are the channels and and here are the sounds and this is you know it's like a sequencer it's like this is this instrument get gets hit at this t- point in the song you know this is the tempo and this is the the volume and um go off and, and play it you know and then pull the samples that that it needs and then play play the midi uh, composition so it, it, i get it you know i mean i think um nintendo have always and it's not just the Game Boy Advance. I think the DS had a synth cartridge as well. Yes, um, it did. And so having that that capability uh, is kind of cool because I mean, MIDI is so so small and so streamlined that you can pretty much set it up on almost any machine. Like the weakest, you know, eight bit machine from back in the day. There's probably some way to get MIDI out of that because it's really, like I said, it's all just kind of ones and zeros over the wire. But um, 
I'm kind of fascinated by MIDI as a uh, technology because it's been around for such a long time and there's so many types of different types of MIDI that I've heard on different systems like there's like even the Sega Genesis had a MIDI cartridge mm -hmm. um, which I'm trying to find because it's like rare as hell but um, the, it can't yeah, it came out in Japan, and um, you know, there's a MIDI in, MIDI out, so you can hook up a, a keyboard to it, and then and then kind of take advantage of the the Genesis uh, chips, the sound chips. There's also, um, like I said, the, the DS, the Game Boy Advance, as you mentioned, but there's also like the Dreamcast had a MIDI disc. I mean, these MIDI discs, man, like um, they're all kind of all over the place, and I, I'm I'm kind of really fascinated by by the whole subject. It, it's kind of cool and. You know, my first computer that I ever had when I was in college was like a, you know, a Pentium computer. This is going back a long time, but it had a sound blaster on there and that had that had a MIDI interface on it as well. And I was like, well, how does this work? You know, like how's how's this different than the sound that's coming out of the sound card? And you know, once you um, hook up like a, a Roland um, MT32 or some type of you know MIDI synthesizer to it then it really opens up this world of oh my god you know i've got all these amazing sounds that weren't available to me for you know for almost next to nothing so it's it's kind of cool man like I, I do need to uh take a look at that game boy advance cartridge though. i think that would be interesting to check out but um if you look at my early stuff on my channel i did actually do a video on midi on some uh 16-bit computers from the 90s mm -hmm. and uh i was kind of messing around with with some of the midi stuff on there so um yeah like i said man i, I, de I definitely have a, a interest and a fascination with with midi for sure cool cool yeah. cool because i'm i was just fascinated on how this could actually work because i saw a, a video a uh, dude had the MIDI controller connected to the Game Boy Advance, and then he was playing on his piano, and he was playing sounds right. for the Game Boy Advance. And I was yeah. like, that's crazy, because it's like, that's a, it's a different form of emulation in a sense. It's like, right. you're, you're getting the sounds over, and you can plug those sounds back into your own, your yep. own music, and mm -hmm. it's... It just brings out possibilities of what's what you could do with that. Yeah, I mean, if I think of it, if I think of it now, I think the way it probably works is because there's what's known as general MIDI, and that's kind of yes. the the standard instruments that you get when you you know you use MIDI. So, mm -hmm. what what what's probably happened there is on that cartridge there is the general MIDI kind of suite of instruments, but they're all mapped to game boy advanced sound effects right so the right. drums is is some type of noise pattern um you know uh the guitar is probably some type of uh wave format or something uh or maybe some some sine wave or some pulse wave so you know as you kind of play your instrument it's just mapping to the sounds on the cartridge and it's it's coming up with these really cool gba style you know uh, music effects which which sounds really cool and I, I know the genesis one is very very similar to that you know you plug your midi keyboard um into the midi in of the cartridge mm -hmm. and then you got access to the you know the ym's uh yamaha chip on on the genesis so you've got that really cool fm sound that that comes through the the, the genesis so yeah i mean i definitely see the appeal there because and it's really a a cool way as well of unlocking and tapping into the sound chip of these these systems because a lot of the times you know with with game consoles especially everything is kind of closed off right i mean you, you you buy games and you play them and you know visually and orally you know you get the experience but if you want to actually tinker around and write your own tunes on these game consoles unless you're like a, a developer and you've got access to a development kit then you're never going to have that ability to tap into the sound. So exactly. ha having Nintendo or um, you know offer these kind of synth cartridges is is really kind of cool. So I, I I I love that stuff. You know when when it kind of they bring out these these kind of utilities that aren't games, but they kind of tap into some of the cool stuff you can do with the, with the console. It's interesting. It's always interesting to see, and it's like it makes you, it just makes you wonder. It's like 
what can someone do with this? Because I've heard some crazy things where you give someone a set of sounds and how sounds can be manipulated. And the one thing that changed my whole mind on this was someone sampled like something from SpongeBob. And when you flip that sound into something totally different, like that, it sounds nothing like it did before. It's amazing what you can do. So I'm thinking like the the uh, um the power on sound that comes on with the Game Boy Advance. Yeah. And imagine if that's turned down in pitch just quite a bit. The best way I could put it is slow it down. So it gives like a like a wave, like a smooth wave right. sound. Right. And then you put an amp on that sound at the same time. Yeah. It's like it'll bring out something that you would never imagine if someone heard the final product they would never guess it was from the um nintendo um, yeah, game boy advance the gba so, yeah yeah so that's why i feel as though it's like having those sounds it's your imagination is the only thing that limits you basically definitely yeah it's really cool and i've always loved computer music you know like on mm -hmm. on old machines old retro machines and and old old systems because some of the stuff like even on the, the original game boy um some of the music that some of these games have on there i think about like donkey kong country and um i mean man some of the some of the stuff that we're getting out of this this like this basic sound device man like there's two pulse channels, a wave channel, and a noise channel, right? And some of the stuff that they were doing just kind of blows your mind. Like some of the amazing music and the amazing effects they were getting out of this stuff. I've always been a big fan of if you're in working in this kind of limited space mm -hmm. with very limited hardware, what's the absolute best you can you can extract out of it? And um, like you, what you just said really makes a lot of sense because now you can you've got this kind of this entire keyboard you know this entire suite of sounds at your disposal and you can do all sorts of cool tricks you know to make it sound nothing like a gba make it sound like something completely different and you know it's really up to the imagination and and your creativity at that point you know exactly yeah but um you're you're well known for doing deep dives when it comes to tech and hardware I'm curious to know, have you ever done like these types of deep dives when it comes to like the DAWs? I haven't. Um, it's something that I'm thinking about. We'll put it that way. Like I, music production is, is very interesting to me as, as we mentioned. And mm -hmm. I get a lot of questions about, oh dude, you know, you should, um, you should do some tutorials about your, your workflow process and, and, and maybe talk about some of the you know some of the doors that you use you know you, maybe you can talk about those i'm i'm kind of i'm not saying i'm going to do this but i'm thinking about maybe a second channel where i kind of do some of that stuff okay because i do find it interesting i mean i i me being you know a nerd right i i always want to know how things work and i always want to know how things work under the covers so i'm not saying it's happening, but um, <laughs> it's something I, I've been thinking about for a while because I do. I get lots of questions about you know how, how do you how do you make music you know how how do you start, what do you do, and what's your process. And look for me, I, I'm like I said, I'm a very kind of visual guy, um, so my workflow process and the way that I produce music, it may be completely backwards as to the way it should be done but it works for me you know and mm -hmm. if 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 people are interested in that um and they want me to start kind of talking about you know doors and stuff like that then yeah i, I may look into it we'll see we'll see but you know uh, time is very precious as well so you know i i, I don't want to um you know spend too much time you know grinding out videos and, and doing stuff like that but yeah man i, I may consider it for sure because I, I think it's definitely an interesting topic and i've always wanted to you know when i did when i started youtube not to sound you know selfish or anything but like i, I made videos kind of for myself you know like something that i feel like i would be interested in and then if other people appreciate it then awesome you know that that's great you know I, I don't make videos, you know, for the people, right? Like I, I kind of make them for me and then 
um, fortunately you know, I've got a lot of people that that you know like what I do so it kind of works out in the end but you know if 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 I don't if I'm not feeling it you know if there's no passion or if there's no creativity there then I'm not gonna do it you know so every time I, I do make a video it's it, it's you know it's always a hundred percent like I, I'm you know it's something that I, I I'm if I'm interested in doing it then you know I'm gonna go ahead and, and do it so um, you and I both share that same philosophy. I've always been someone who's, if I'm interested in something, I want to talk about it. And, yeah. you know, as a human, you grow from time to time. At one point, I was really interested in doing gaming news topics, rumors and stuff. Yeah. I fell out of it. And yeah, there... <laughs> if the heart's not there, man, like, people will see through People, exactly. People will see through you, you know, and that's not that's not to, to disrespect or anything it's just the way it is you know like if you're not if you're not a hundred percent you know invested in something they're gonna see it you know exactly. uh, and, and 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 from your perspective you're probably like uh it's like work at that point it's not it's not really that it's not fun you know i already um, spend 40 hours yeah. someplace else you have a, you have a day job right and then so. you gotta you know grind out a a, a news video it's not it's not really something that sounds like a lot of fun you know um for me you know youtube is is a, is an escape from you know the the hustle and bustle of a, a 40 hour work week it's okay you know i've had to deal with uh work this week now let's do something really cool so um you know that that's that's why uh you know i i, I like what i do on on the channel and and yeah, I mean, back to back to your question. Um, not going to rule it out. I mean, I think I, I may may go down that path. You know, there, there may be a second channel that, that that pops up. So that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I'm I'm li listen. You guys, <laughs> you guys heard it. It's not confirmed, but <laughs> a possibility of a second channel that's for musicians or music based or just deep dives if you're into a whole bunch of music stuff. So yeah. If you guys will stick around for a little bit longer, we have another commercial for you guys and featuring the one and only MVG. Stay tuned. The Game Boy system on a chip is home to not just the CPU, audio hardware and I.O. It also houses the PPU or pixel processing unit. The Game Boy resolution is 160 pixels wide by 144 pixels vertically and it has four colors, or I should say four shades of gray or green, depending on what model Game Boy you are using. So let's do some quick math. We just said that the Game Boy has eight kilobytes of VRAM and the size of the display is 160 by 144 pixels. If we use a traditional frame buffer approach to draw each pixel color value sequentially and render the frame buffer, we would need almost 23 kilobytes of RAM to do so. Remember, we only have 8 kilobytes of VRAM to work with. So how is this limitation overcome? Well, the Game Boy doesn't actually have a frame buffer at all, and it's not possible to just plot pixels on the 160 by 144 frame buffer individually. To conserve and optimize graphic space, all background images are assembled utilizing tiles. A tile is an 8 by 8 pixel square, which supports a palette of four colors. The Game Boy can store a maximum of 256 tiles in VRAM. We said that each tile is 8 by... Welcome back, everybody. Hope you enjoyed that commercial. Um, MVG, I'm, I have a question to ask you. I want to know when the work week is over, when you're done, you have time to just say, you know what, I'm done with work for the week, whether that's whatever you have to do, even YouTube or whatever. What is it that you pick up to play that you could just pick up and play when the week is over? Like, you know what? This is my console of choice to mm -hmm. play. Man, that that's a that's a tough question. It, it's not. It's uh, you know, I, I've played a lot of games, and and for me, I've always been a gamer. You know, mm -hmm. like I always find the time during the week to at least spend you know 10 to 12 hours a week playing video games and um but for pick up and play that that's a good question i mean lately i've kind of been playing all sorts of stuff man like uh on the switch you know 
Uh, I played and finished Link, Link's Awakening, and I, I played and Amazing finished. Um, oh yeah, dude, it's probably probably what uh, probably one of t- my top five favorite games this year. Same here, you know, no doubt. Um, and even higher on that list actually was Luigi's Mansion Three, which oh. I, I dude, I love that game. I, I, I played and finished that as well. But um, to counter that, uh, I also played and finished Death Stranding, which I know a lot of people didn't really get into, but I thought the game was was amazing, so I, I I started playing it and I couldn't put it down. Like I just kept playing and playing it until I beat the game, and I was like, "Wow, man!" You know, I get I get the the polarization and the you know the the the, the critics. Um, I understand both sides of the discussion there about why people don't like that game, but for me, something just resonated with me on that game, and I I, I couldn't put it down. So, um, I also played, uh, um, Jedi Knight, uh, Fallen Order as well, Star Wars. That? It's excellent. I, I really enjoyed that game. I uh, had a lot of fun playing that game. It was something that EA didn't really seem to push that much this year. And it kind of fell under the radar of a lot of people because EA, for whatever reason, didn't spend the marketing budget on this game, and I don't really get why they did that or it's why sh- they didn't do that. It's a shame that EA doesn't really push the games that Respawn has done for them because Respawn has saved their behind. Oh yeah, big man. time. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, t- Titanfall Two was the same. They they didn't really push that when that came out. Titanfall was an Xbox re- uh, Xbox One exclusive, and you know, so you're already kind of only using a third of the entire gaming base that want to play that game because people on the ps4 never got a chance to play titanfall and when it came to the ps4 with titanfall 2 they didn't really push the game very much as well now obviously apex legends has you know printed money for ea and that's a good thing because respawn for whatever reason man they they haven't been that you know that that yeah i mean you're right they, they've kind of saved their behinds you know more than once so but yeah i mean I, i've played a lot of stuff man like but I, I guess to answer your question you know what would i what would i jump and and, and pick up and play like it's got to be something that i can jump in and play about you know an hour's worth and get my fix of something and that usually means it's like Call of Duty or uh, some some jump in game where I can just jump in and play and then kind of jump out. Um, you know, the Switch has got some really good games like that as well. Obviously, that that I've played uh, this year um, for that. But man, I mean, this year I've played a lot of games, dude. And I, you know, for me, um, a lot of people say, you know, we didn't have this big standout game this year like we normally do, like. There was no Red Dead or there was no God of War, but I kind of look at it differently in that there were so many great games that came out pretty much from January all the way through November where we we were kind of spoiled for choice, man. Like there were so many great games um, that came out, you know, every single month there was some good releases and hopefully next year that will continue and I think it will. Um, next year, obviously, there's going to be some big games that have already been announced that, that are coming, and we don't know what Nintendo is going to bring. I mean, we know Animal Crossing and a couple of other things are coming, but um, once they announce the next Direct, I'm sure they'll, that'll set us up for what's to come. But, you know, Breath of the Wild 2 is probably something that's going to get, get announced next year um, uh, as far as when we'll see the game. So that's exciting. But, yeah, man, like, pick up and play i mean it's hard to answer that right now man there's been so much stuff i've kind of i've played and and i'm continuing to play like control was another game that i that i played and finished and i didn't really care for that one as much but i did want to give it a go because i know it got you know nominations for a game of the year and stuff like that so i thought i'd give it a chance but um but yeah man like um yeah, you know the switch has some really really killer games for for that style for sure the Switch has been mine as well, but it's funny you mentioned Apex Legends because if it's not the Switch, the only game I play on this PC is Apex yeah. Legends. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I I totally get it when you know when, when it, that's my EA game that I I support uh, Apex, but um, it's 
it's crazy because a lot of the games, like you said, mentioned on the Switch, it's like you're right. It's like we had a lot of just great games. Yeah. You know, you have, we mentioned Zelda Link's Awakening. Mm-hmm. Uh, for those who are into it, you had Fire Emblem, you had Ash oh, yeah, Shade. Dude. Yeah. People don't mention this game as much, but for me, I like Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3. Uh, I thought it was pretty good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For people who who liked it, I'm I'm gonna mention it. Do do for the people who did like it, Death Stranding. You have yeah, uh, Jedi Fallen um Fallen Order. Order. Yeah, you have so many. There was just so many games that came out this year. Devil May Cry, De- Resident Devil Evil. Devil May Cry, Resident yeah. Evil, Sekiro. Even yep. the Pokemon game for oh, yeah. for some people was a great game. So it's Absolutely. like there's Luigi's Mansion. So there's so there was so many games that came out. I remembered. Um, even Damon X Machida, mm-hmm. like from June to literally December, from both major to indie games alike, there's been a lot of games that dropped, and yeah, we got announcement of the Doom games. The Doom series was announced. We had the Torok games come out. Yep. I feel like the reason why we didn't see much of a presence at um, the Game Awards from Nintendo is because Nintendo is saving everything for their January direct. I I I one thousand percent agree with you. I remember uh, we were talking on the Spawncast about this the you know the week before, and we were kind of trying to figure out what Nintendo would bring. And you know, I, I kind of I, I said to the guys on the cast that I didn't feel like because they were talking about Breath of the Wild too. Mm-hmm. I'm like, it doesn't feel right to me. It doesn't feel you know Nintendo has had such an amazing year. Give them, give them time to, to get the next Direct ready to go, you know, next year. I mean, you know there's one coming probably late January, February. Uh, at the latest, you know, we'll see. And that'll set up what, what's coming next year. But I didn't feel like Nintendo had really much to show at the at the Game Awards. And they didn't. And I, I, I was okay with that. You know, I was like, so was I. man, they, they've had such a fantastic year. You know, one of the best years they've ever had, you know, for a long, long time. So just give them a chance, man. Give them a chance to just you know t- take it all in and and um, and get get set up for next year. I'm I'm, I'm good. I, I was good with you know the the little that they had to show at the Game Awards. I thought I was totally fine with it. I agree. Like yeah, one of the things that I feel like a lot of people you know take one of the things I feel like a lot of people take for granted is the fact that um, Nintendo has always gotten criticized for not having any games at the beginning of the year with the whole switch cycle every switch cycle there are no games at the beginning of the year none everyone has complained about that and i feel nintendo wanted to change course with that they Mm -hmm. wanted to have games from the beginning to the end of the year which is why um i know animal crossing got moved but trials of mana comes out in april Dude, I can't wait for that game. That's the game I'm waiting for. That's my favorite game on the Super NES. Oh hell yeah! yeah. I, the, that collection of Mana, uh, man, That's, that is that is one of my favorite releases they brought out this same year. Same here. Yeah. That's another release they had this year. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah, there's there's just a lot when it comes to Nintendo, and I'm like you, I'm happy with what they did this year, and I'm fine with what they did at the Game Awards. Me too. Like the Game Awards is uh, is interesting because I, um, I I tend to not get too overhyped about the show because you know that there's all this hype around before the show that oh you know what are we going to see at the Game Awards? And look, I don't want to take anything away from the Xbox Series X because that came out of nowhere, right? That, that was that a surprise. That was and, a shocker. And, and you know, all it takes is one big announcement, and that's what it was. So I, I, w- I was good with that. But I also felt like we're not going to see like anything mind blowing in terms of games, you know, that 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 uh, at the Game Awards, because not just Nintendo, but you know, Sony and Microsoft, they've got they've got a big year next year, you know, and. Um, the Game Awards is not the right time to, to to you know to show you know their big releases for next year. You know it's it's early next year. It's going to be you know we're hearing that Sony's going to be announcing the PS5 kind of officially in February. So there'll be something there. We talked about Nintendo. They'll have um, their first direct of the year probably late January, early Feb. And then you know we're hearing Microsoft is going to show off the xbox series x in more detail 
with you know a price and and more games sometime in march so you know game awards not the right time of year for for really you know um for any of that it, you know for me the game awards and, and i guess for many many people is it's a celebration of the year that we've had you know we, we this is what we had in video games it was a fantastic year as mentioned there were so many great releases let's celebrate it you know it, it's not necessarily oh you know there's going to be some massive announcements that are made uh, as far as games. And so I was okay with Nintendo not really showing much. Uh, I know some people were unhappy about it. I, 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 I kind of respect it, but I also don't agree with it. But, uh, you know, um, next yeah. year, man, like uh, <laughs> it, it, four weeks away, you know, four weeks from now, we're going to see, you know, the announcements that Nintendo make. And look, there's going to be some some good stuff that, that that's coming next year, no doubt. Definitely, but um, I wanted to mention games like um, I mentioned Apex Legends on like the on the PC because it looks beautiful on the, on the PC. But I also want to mention um, more so Death Stranding. Now, in just gaming, this is just the the last question of the night, and I want to make yeah. it like a tech question. Uh, we've hit a graphical peak of gaming, and honestly, law diminishing of return is truly evident. But my question to you is. Do you think we'll ever hit a performance peak in gaming? Oh, man, that's a good question. Um, yeah, that, that, that's an interesting, interesting question because with with video games and the way that we have consoles, it's all about the lowest common denominator. You know what I'm saying? So you could have the fastest, most powerful PC in the world but it doesn't really matter because you've you've also got the same game that runs on the original Xbox One, you know, which looks terrible and and, and plays terrible. So with Microsoft, you know, bringing a new console next generation, the Series X, which looks really powerful, and the graphics that we saw with with Hellblade Two look, you know amazing you know almost realistic but then you hear you know by the same token well we've got to support you know the existing consoles right so what does that mean as far as performance goes so i i think i think um that's a that's a great question uh will we ever reach a peak performance in gaming i don't know man like i i i sometimes i i I struggle with this because with the Xbox One, it seemed like they were going for realism and, and yeah, for power, right? But um, initially, they didn't really care about you know 60 frames, you know. And then all of a sudden, now the push is well, let's see if we can do 4K 60. But the Xbox One X can't do 4K 60. The PS4 Pro can't do 4K 60. I also question whether the next generation can even though they're targeting 4k 60 that doesn't necessarily mean they will get 4k 60 mm -hmm. right um i mean I, I do think that everything is going to run at 4k next generation it's not going to be you know 1440p or checkerboarding but will they kind of hit peak performance or will there be a peak performance in gaming i i, I don't think so man like i, I think I think, I think so if we keep, you know, if the, the sweet spot for game consoles is, let's say, $399, let us say the Xbox Series X is $499, which is what we think it's going to be, it, you know, there's going to be some, some restrictions and limitations on performance. It, it's just the way it is, you know. Um, you'll get a good 4K experience, 4K30, no problem. 4K60, I don't think so, man. And... <laughs> You know, the Switch and Nintendo, I mean, that's never been a motivator for them, you know, like the Switch has always been, or Nintendo has always been about good games, you know, and, and, but, but on top of that, you know, you look at something like Link's, uh, Link's Awakening and you look at Luigi's Mansion, they're able to extract the, the, the absolute best out of, out of what they have, you know, mm -hmm. so it, it's never been a motivator for Nintendo. I mean, Sony as well, I mean, they're, they're talking pretty pretty large with the ps5 but again you know i, I don't think we're going to get you know we, we, we're going to get some games that run at 4k 60 but 
we're not it's you know gonna it, be, it's, it's gonna be a dime in a dozen exactly i think 4k 30 is going to be the you know the the target for, for for most games um with the occasional 4k 60 title that that gets hit but um until they literally start selling you a pc in a box you know um which, which the xbox series x which that's what starting, it looks like we're starting to get there right mm-hmm. but um but you know they sell it to you for like a thousand dollars or something it, there's always going to be a you know a restriction or a limitation around performance you know i agree it's um i look at you know just even my computer and it's like i have a Ryzen threadripper the mm-hmm. processor alone <laughs> yeah is worth like the price of two xbox when it first oh, yeah. came out when it for xbox one x first came out it's like the price of two xbox one x's just for the processor this is not counting the ram this is not counting the graphics card right so it's like you know it's there's just a lot that goes into making these things and i always look at you know i've always been more of a performance guy that's why i do appreciate the switch because even though mario odyssey wasn't a full 1080p i think it was 900p 60 frames per second yeah but still ran 60 though it still ran 60 yeah that's the that's the that's the crazy part it ran 60 and yeah. nintendo has made that almost a standard um you can say whatever you want about um yoshi a lot of people ke- was critiquing yoshi's resolution but i said this game is locked at almost 60 frames the entire game yep and the thing about it is i had to i had a few people back me up on this i, I did a video about this again i was passionate about it because um on the side, my side hustle, side, side hustle to side hustle at one point was 3D modeling. Okay, yeah. So I understood rendering very well when it comes to models. And I just said, you, the, they're rendering realistic models. And I, when I look at realistic models, putting those in HD in full animation is a lot. Mm-hmm. And then the first thing I thought about, you got to think about the budget of the game that's the same thing that's going to factor into these 4k 60 games what is the budget of the game that's going to allow the output to fit yeah. all of that into one blu-ray disc and the same thing goes for the switch what is going to be the output to fit all this into a an eight gigabyte disc mm-hmm. because i gotta tell you that game was not a 16 gigabyte game right that's a eight gigabyte cartridge yeah so if their budgets for eight gigabyte gigabyte cartridges then you have to it's not the fact that they can't make it 1080p 60 it's budgeting for the cartridges and the space allocated in those cartridges that you could actually use for it to look good and to run well at the same time right i i I, when i think about game consoles especially the up-and-coming generation you know there's a lot of hype around performance of, of these systems but i think about your point about your Threadripper, you know, processor, mm-hmm. you know, costs more than um, the, you know, the the game console. I I I I agree with you. I mean, I think um, this Xbox Series X, right? It's it's going to be a powerful system. It's going to be the most powerful console yeah. in the world, right? And that that's that's not marketing hype. That's real. But I also understand you know how much money it costs to build a gaming pc that's capable of running games at 4k 60 right and sure as hell is not going to be 499 you know if you look no. at piece and with ray tracing as well let's not forget that you know they talk about hardware ray tracing um the cheapest ray tracing graphics card that i see is a 400 dollar gtx 2060 right so you've already kind of eaten into what you know two-thirds of of the cost of a console so i know for a fact because we always hear this you know every time there's a new generation there's all this hype about power and performance and 4k this and 60 frames that um the targets will definitely be 4k 60 but it will most likely you know run 95 percent of of games at 4k 30 locked you know it's going to look great it's going to play great it's going to be smooth but 4k 60 yeah but 4k 60 is not going to be um it's going to be the the kind of the exception rather than the rule i think you know for for the next I gen see that. i can see like probably like a mid-gen game 
Yeah. Possibly like maybe like a Grand Theft Auto Six that'll probably do that to bring more people right. in. Yeah. Or a new God of War game that could bring people in. Yep. But it's... well, they'll drop the res. You know, they'll 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 just yeah. do the fourteen forty p checkerboarding. They'll run it at sixty at fourteen forty p, no problem. But it won't be true four k sixty. Exactly. Like, dude, I've got my PC that I'm on now is a. 1080 Ti graphics card like and that. and a 8700K Intel right six six cores twelve threads. Um, I can't run Resident Evil 2 remake at 4K 60 locked. You know what I'm saying? Like it's it, it runs 4K 60 most of the time, but you know it dips. You know it dips to 40. It dips to to 55 frames. I mean it doesn't lock at, at 4K 60. So. Um, so what does that tell you? Do they do they just keep the frame frame rate uncapped, or do they just smooth it out at, at 4K 30? And I think the the general thought process there is to provide a smooth smooth experience, gaming experience. So it's well, most likely going to be 4K 30, you know, for for these systems. So yeah, I I, I don't think uh, we'll ever reach peak performance uh, in gaming unless they start selling game consoles at a thousand dollars that's what you that's when you quit the game it's like okay new hobby yeah. <laughs> or just just build build a gaming pc you know uh Which, or just go that path and that's that's basically the route that i have i said right now it's not a full-out gaming pc it's a multi-purpose pc where i do my music editing my video editing my yep. not 3d modeling so much anymore i don't got the time but more so video and music editing so but um thank you again for coming on this was an, an amazing show do you um quick before we close out do you have anything that you want to say like any last words to anyone that's watching um not really man just want to say thanks for uh, having me on the show man it's been it's been an absolute blast um check me out on on youtube if you haven't followed uh me yet I'm sure we'll we'll have the links down for you below. Uh, I'm on Twitter. I, I tweet every day, so if you wanna wanna chat with me, uh, I'm usually on there. Um, you know, looking at the latest and at what's going on in the in in the gaming landscape, as well as other things. But otherwise, man, no. Uh, thank you so much for having me on. It's been it's been awesome to talk to you for the last hour or so, man. Yeah, I really appreciate same, it. Same here. I appreciate you coming on, and uh, make sure you guys follow him on both Twitter and on YouTube, and. Um, do you what's your bandcamp there? Uh, it's modernvintagegamer.bandcamp.com. So uh, yeah, uh, so you have yeah. all links down down below to check him out. And, and just real quick on that, um, I'm uploading more music to that uh, in the next few days. So I, I've there's some things on my YouTube channel that haven't been uploaded. And I get a lot of requests for it. So I am going to take some time to upload more stuff to Bandcamp because I know a lot of people have been asking about it. Nice. Nice. I'm looking forward to it. De Def Thank gotta, you. Definitely got to check out your Bandcamp. I did not know you had a Bandcamp, so I got to check out your Bandcamp. I, I did. I did. And I, I know we're, we're at the end here, yep, but I want to tell you, uh, I used to be on SoundCloud, but um, I moved to Bandcamp. And I got to say, Bandcamp, for me at least, is... A much better experience than SoundCloud um, that I had on SoundCloud. So, uh, for those for those people that are thinking about getting into music productions and um, you know, uploading music, I, I personally would recommend you check out Bandcamp. They're, they've been very very good to me on on that platform. I'm actually going to agree with him on that because I've been on both platforms. I've been on SoundClick, SoundCloud, and I've been on Bandcamp. And I've been on Bandcamp since 2011. And I will say that's my older work. Um, yeah. I haven't had newer work up on this band camp, which that may come soon. I may do a compilation of beats for you guys and just have it up on, on band camp because make a new band camp for Avedon Smith and have it for you guys, just for you guys, just, you know, just because it'll be yeah. free, just for free, just for free for you guys. That'd be coming soon. But that's um, what I do. Yeah, my, my stuff on there is all free. Yeah. See, see, free music for you guys. You have, you have, there you, you, go. you have more of a reason to go ahead and check it out. <laughs> but um, SoundCloud, it's more of a social media ish, social media esque. Yeah. And if you don't want that aspect, you just want just to listen to music and not really s sift through comments or the WAV files. You just want an easy to download experience. I recommend Bandcamp to you as well. For sure. So, Thank you guys for watching this episode of Beats for Breakfast. If you enjoyed this episode, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and most of all, most of all, you make sure 
you share this with a friend. This is Avadon and MVG, and we are out. Peace.